to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Um, I yep. want to jump right in because um, we got to talk about um, HR 40. We got to talk about what AOC and uh, people and progressive likes yourselves were able to put into the American Rescue uh, pla uh, Plan. Uh, is that what it's called? The ARP? Yeah, the American Rescue yep. Plan uh, with regard to reimbursing families up to $9,000. Uh, with um, funeral costs, uh, there's a lot to delve into. Um, where would you like to start, Mr. Jamal Bowman? First of all, uh, th thank you for having me. It's always good to be with you all. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this goes back to the presidential campaign and the strong showing from Bernie Sanders. And because of his strong showing, it showed, you know, President Biden and many others that progressives are here to stay and progressives are serious, they're organized and we are relentless in our demands for what, what the country needs moving forward. So from that strong showing, even though the party organized around President Biden, soon to be President Biden, there was a, there was a Sanders-Biden coalition that was formed. And that collaboration led to the most progressive democratic platform uh, in history, quite frankly. So you saw, you know, a, a commitment to investing in environmental justice, I believe in, in the neighborhood of $2 trillion with 40% going towards communities of color. You saw the commitment of investments uh, in education, in early childcare, in true infrastructure. So there were some commitments made then. And then, quite frankly, you know, the president delivered on those commitments with the first part of his Build Back Better plan. So the first part, the American Rescue Plan, I mean, when you look at my district, I'm gonna give you the hard numbers here. So we have the Mount Vernon School District receiving $20 million coming in. We have the Yonkers School District receiving $68 million from this plan, this American mm. Rescue Plan. Compare that to Bronxville, which is also in my district, they're only receiving $317,000. So let's contrast that, right? When we talk about equity, when we talk about racial justice, when we talk about historically underfunded schools, you know, the Biden administration delivered. And the Biden administration delivered because progressives on the ground, beginning with the grassroots, organizing with the people, uh, supporting candidates like Bernie Sanders, AOC, myself, and many others. And the Biden administration has responded. And, and let me just say, that's only part one of a three-part plan. We have the jobs plan coming up next, and then we have another plan that's a part of this. So we're going to see tons of investments in cities and states and counties and schools, um, and we're going to see it in the areas where working people need the most support. You mentioned the support for people, unfortunately, who, who have lost a loved one due to COVID, uh, money coming in to support, support them with burial so services, rental assistance, mortgage assistance, get, get assistance, getting people back to work. So a lot of great things happening right now, but we got to keep the, the pressure on. Um, now, Jamal, in Yonkers, the money you just articulated, the difference between what's coming into Mount Vernon and Yonkers school districts, differentiating from Bronxville, is specifically addressing equity. I just want to reiterate that for the audience yeah. and go a little bit farther there because often, right, um, you know, listen, most people get their news from the baller alerts and the shade rooms mm -hmm. um, that operate in our, unfortunately, in our communities. Then there in our city, New York, one, you know, maybe auntie and grandma watch, you know, the, the, the local news and hopefully a couple of people check into Ebro, Lauren Rosenberg every morning. And we get this info, but I, I just want to once again, because we've been taking these moments in this first, what are we in five, four months of the Biden pre presidency to show people how voting matters. Yes, because sometimes it gets lost. Right. It, it, you know, when when uh, because there is a system of doing things in this country, uh, it requires votes. It requires participations from the, the, the local communities. It requires people to elect people like yourself and AOC and other individuals in the city. It requires participation, city council, the mayor. There's so much work to be done. But I just want to take this moment to once again show why voting matters, because a coalition of of progressives 
and Democrats, progressive Democrats and moderate Democrats under in the Biden administration, Biden was listening. Yes. You, absolutely. And, and people need to understand that if Donald Trump were president, I would not be able to share these numbers with you and this focus on equity as part of this American rescue plan. And, you know, I want to highlight that point because Donald Trump's vote share grew in New York City from 2016 to 2020. So whatever reason, uh, whatever the reason, more people believed in him in 2020 than 2016, which is insane to me. Having said that, you know, if he would have won, we would not be having this conversation. We would not have a president who in his inaugural address uh, centered racial equity and, and, and social justice. And, and the, the, listen, where we invest our budget, where we invest our dollars really matters. And to respond this strongly, particularly with our schools, and you know I'm always big on education because of my background. You know, if you're, if you're more likely to live in the suburbs, uh, your schools were, underfund were overfunded by like $20 billion over the last several decades due to redlining. This first part of the American res Rescue Plan is a response to that. And to your point about local elections, uh, city councils, state house, county, et cetera, the state house recently in New York State recently passed the most progressive budget that I can remember in my lifetime. We're finally raising taxes on the wealthy. We're finally fully funding the campaign for fiscal equity, which means we're going to fund our, our historically marginalized schools at uh, at 100% at the 100% clip in alignment with the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit, not to get too much in the weeds there, but then we're also providing 2.1 billion for undocumented workers who have been kept out of the federal stimulus package. So voting in state elections, voting in city elec elections, voting in federal elections for people who are fighting for the working class, bottom line. So uh, now look where we are just, now. So Laura, what is the budget? I, okay, go Laura, just really quickly, um, because I know you care about funding of schools, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The other piece of this, though, is the Mount Vernon and Yonkers school board making sure when the money comes in, it's not botched. Correct. Because yes. we've seen this before many yeah. times. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, I, and right. I just and I just see I just hear it because I have been one of those people who have actually donated to teachers who are on Twitter with Amazon wish list because they can't afford to pay for all the necessities they need in their classroom, which is completely unfair. No teacher should have to fund this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So to me, we see things like this get botched over and over. And for the life of me, I can't understand. I was like, why is it that we know that certain neighborhoods historically have been uh, excuse my language, they've been fucked. You know what I mean? And it's not fair for all these teachers to constantly be fighting be, um, and, 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 and paying things out of their own pocket when there's money for them. So I just sometimes, you know, I, I get really weary and, I, and it's like, how are we going to guarantee that these neighborhoods get what they deserve and the teachers get what they need, even after budgets are passed? So you're absolutely right. Uh, you should be wary. Um, because we have seen this before. We have seen an influx of billions, tens of billions of dollars coming in. And for whatever reason, teachers are still buying their own school supplies. So you should be wary. Here's what I think is different this time around. Uh, number one, I've only been talking about uh, city school districts. The city itself, it's also getting its own influx of tens of millions of dollars to support city employees and city infrastructure. So usually they'll take from education and take from healthcare to fund city uh, services. They don't have to do that now because money's coming into states, counties, and cities separate from the education money. So the money is there. The second piece is I think we have the right leaders in place right now to make it work in the way it needs to work. And it has to be done through collaboration. So New York City has a new school chancellor, Misha Ross Porter. She used to be my superintendent uh, in District 11. So I know what she's all about. She's a great leader and great leader for this moment. New York State has um, uh, Commissioner Betty Renta, 
again, you know, immigrant from Puerto Rico, used to be an ESL uh, student, was a teacher, principal, superintendent, and now commissioner. She's coming from the right perspective. Dr. Quesada in Yonkers, uh, coming from the right perspective. Dr. Hamilton in, in Mount Vernon, coming from the right perspective. And yours truly, with all humility, is the vice chair of the Ed and Labor Committee in Congress as we speak. So I've been in communication with all of the above and then some, as well as teachers unions and, and principals unions, et cetera, to bring us to the table in collaboration, because that's the key. We can't be working in silos and isolation, trying to figure it out on our own. How can we work in collaboration to create, to reimagine and redesign our school system in a way that empowers teachers to meet the needs of our kids? That's what I'm all about. People are open to that. And, and you're right, it's now or never. We don't get this right. We can't complain about, oh, we don't have this or we don't have that five or 10 years from now. On that note, um, let's sit right there because there will be noise from the other side, which is the charter schools and the corporations that own charter schools that are going to be picking whatever y'all do apart. Because it doesn't, it, it, am I correct in assuming that there is a tug of war uh, between the public school system and the charter school system. There's people who have lost complete faith in the abilities of the public school system to meet the requirements to prepare kids for the jobs of tomorrow and to get around the bureau uh, bureaucracy and actually get some things done for these kids to be prepared to fill the jobs that will be available in the next five and ten years. So it's going to be a tug of war there. How do we make sure that that's not a tug of war and there's some um, some cohesive movement? I, I think the myth of charter schools as the panacea, panacea of education, as the solution that's going to take our kids to the next level, next level, that myth has been debunked. When we look at the data over the last 20 years of charter schools versus public schools, kids are performing about the same in both settings. And that's and in public schools where we take uh, more students with, with disabilities. We take more English language learners more students who come from Title I settings. Uh, we don't do the skimming off the top, if you will, as some have argued charter schools have done. So that, that myth of the charter school solution has been debunked. And when you look at schools like the school well, I used to- I just, I just wanna say, I, don't, I, don't, I, I just think people lost faith in getting things done at the public school level. And as a yep. parent, you're looking for another solution. Like, yo, I don't have time to be playing with the teachers union fighting over this and this not getting this and this. I ain't got time to be waiting for an, another elected official and the school board and this, and this person paying a consultant and they blew them, I don't have time. I need to get my child in something now so mm -hmm. that they can compete tomorrow and so that they can get a job and participate and not get left behind and have an opportunity at success. That's what parents are dealing with. They don't got time for all of this. And the public school system, I'm not against the public school system. I'm a public school kid. But I know for my child who goes to private school, the reason is, is the options for great public schools were limited. And so I didn't have time to be playing with her life. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're working to change right now. And when I say right now, I mean, by September, when we open back up, we have to have phenomenal schools on every block in every community for every person, period. And the work that we do now in between now and September is going to be critical to making sure when we open back up, every single school is phenomenal. And that happens. We have the funding coming in. It also happens with new ideas, with collaboration, and a new direction. Listen, I ran a school in a Title I school, middle school in the Northeast Bronx, right? right, Same block as Boston Seacore Housing Project, close to Eden Wall, right across the highway from Co-op City. We were consistently ranked as one of the most uh, academically excellent schools because of the academic growth our kids made while they were with us coming in at levels one and two and leaving at levels three and four. Now, I don't subscribe to the state test as, as the, the measure that we need to be using, but even if you use that measure, our schools were doing well. But in addition to that, and even more importantly, our kids were learning how to code in middle school. They were learning how to grow organic fruits and vegetables in middle school. Love they were that. participating in theater, the arts, and 
a collaborative project-based curriculum. And that's why, you know, we were celebrated for the work that we've done. So there are many schools like that out there. The point is we need to make all schools like that. That's in right. The public right. School system. right. HR 40 reparations. So yes. I'm tweeting about it yesterday. Uh, you know, um, the the frustration for black folks is always this constant conversation, ignoring the people who just aren't for it because they're going to be ignored. But, you know, embracing individuals that are like, listen, we want to research how this would happen and the best way to make sure that it happens. Me and you have had conversations about it. Where is it at today? What's going on and what are the conversations? So H.R. 40 is being marked up in committee today. This is the first time it has ever been marked up in committee. So what does that mean? Marked up, marked up. So it was introduced initially in 1989. Mm. It's never gotten to the point where the committee is looking at it and, and discussing amendments to it. That is usually the first step before it gets to the floor for a vote. So it's never gotten to this point before. And it's at that point today Big shout out to Sheila Jackson Lee and Cobra. Texas, and Texas so in many, the building. Absolutely. And Cobra and so many of the organizers on the outside and inside to make that happen. So it's being marked up. After markup, if the markup goes well, and fingers crossed it will, it will be brought to the floor for a vote. So this during this, during this Congress, this can happen, which would be historic. And what does Hopefully. H.R. 40 say will happen? Because that's not reparations mm -hmm. happening. H.R. 40 is about the how. Yeah, that's right. It's, to, it's, the, it's the, the what, the why, and the how, right? So form a commission to study the need for reparations, to study the historical impact of uh, de facto and de jure racism, which is government-sanctioned policy racism like New Deal, Homestead Act, slavery, and redlining, but also uh, other policies which are um, not really government sanctions, but happen anyway, like mass incarceration and others, which some would argue is government sanctioned. So study the impact of all that on the African-American community and, and, then, and then ask the question, do we need reparations to atone for all of this? And when you look at you know, examples, Germany after the Holocaust, America after Japanese internment camps, uh, R Rwanda, South Africa after apartheid. There are examples of this both here and globally that show us we need a process of truth and reconciliation and we need some form of reparations to level the playing field, which is all about equity, equality, and moving forward as, a, as the democracy we claim we want to be. So we're in a good place today uh, and hopefully after today we'll begin to move forward toward a vote. Um, the next question is, uh, I see you tweeting a lot about Scott Stringer, uh, who is a candidate for mayor. Uh, why yeah. is it you're so supportive of Scott Stringer versus I other think. candidates? And what do you know that we don't know about, uh, you know, other <laughs> candidates, uh, whether it be Andrew Yang, Diane Morales, who I like, um, uh, Mayor Maya, I think uh, Maya, what's Maya's last name? Um, Wiley. 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 Yeah. Wiley um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Eric Adams, or, or Eric. whom I like also. Uh, tell us what you know that we don't know. So I like Maya. Um, I like Diane. Uh, Scott was very helpful to me uh, during that during my campaign, and that meant a lot to me. He was helpful to me both behind the scenes and out front. He took a big risk endorsing me. Um, so that was a big deal for me, and that's something that I'm going to – that's why I'm turning around and supporting him. In addition to, you know, lifelong New Yorker experience at different levels of government, but truly has evolved and has a progressive mindset and disposition in terms of how he governs. When we talk about the issue of climate change, when we talk about police reform, when we talk about education, which is a big, a big uh, platform for Scott, um, when we talk about the working class and, and housing justice and food justice, Scott is right there with me in terms of those issues. Um, so the issues, his experience, his evolution um, as a progressive, um, his support of me during my campaign, where you know a lot of a lot of other people, you know, didn't think I had a shot and didn't support me, um, is why I'm supporting him for mayor. Um, 
And do you like Andrew Yang? Do you like uh, Eric Adams also? So I don't really know um, them like that. I don't know Eric Adams like that. I don't know Andrew Yang like that. I know people who know Andrew Yang, um, and they tell me he has a lot of good ideas, but there's a strong disconnect between him and working class people uh, from the perspective of empathy and compassion and really understanding what people in New York go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I don't know either one of them pers personally, neither one of them has, have reached out to me. Eric once, we had one conversation back back when I was running, uh, but I don't know enough about them to really you know, throw my weight behind them. Even though I know Yang, what I've heard hasn't been good things. Um, do you are you in favor of how we're voting in the city this this time? This ranked choice voting. Yes, I mean if that's what the people want, and it seems like that's what the people want, um, I support it a hundred percent. I mean it's tough, man. I mean a lot of these candidates are really good, you know, and it, and it's hard to just you know pick one over the other. So if you get the opportunity to rank them, yeah. and depending upon how the ranks fall, you know, land. And that determines the next mayor or city council person. I think I think that's powerful, man. So it, it it seems like a good thing. The people want it, and you know, all of these people running. I got t I ran for office. And I know what it takes. That shit is hard. So like, I, I got respect for anyone running for office, and and if they can be a part of a ranked choice system, which gives them a, a shot, another shot at the apple after the first round of votes, I think it's a good thing. I saw oh. you on, on Twitter um, have some choice words for these robotic police dogs that were out. I'm just it, Yo. It, <laughs> only because to me, we have so many discussions about money, about budgets, about defunding the police, about, you know, hiring people who are, you know, um, are, are trained specifically in the areas of mental health. And then we see these robot police dogs that are popping up first of all did you know that this was happening and share with the public your thoughts on on this whole thing so but here, here's the thing right so again we're always crying broke we're always right. crying we don't have money for this or that or that or this but we have money to build robot police dogs like we have money to build like you know how much time and energy and intellectual capacity and money goes into building one of those things and then the video i see is them of this robot dog walking into the projects right projects right, that really have been been defunded for 30 years and haven't received a dime from the federal government in 10 years not one dime not one cent but that money's been going to police uh, departments, and now police departments are building robot police dogs. Like it, so if someone is, is going through uh, psychological distress, mental distress, and they need to call the police, is that robot dog going to come and help that person out? If well, so, so, far, if so far, they claim the dog, which is controlled by remote, so there's a human controlling it by remote. It's basically, you know, it's a, it's a remote-controlled dog is to go into places that are potentially dangerous first and use the camera to look around and see what's going on to keep police out of harm's way. Look, I read up on it. Matter of fact, people done already posted, you know how to, you know how I get on the internet. People done already posted how to disable the damn dog. You know Good. what I'm saying? They it's, yeah, <laughs> using Wi-Fi blockers and all type of other stuff to disable the damn thing. So but, but this uh, listen, listen, I do not want any police officer to be hurt or killed on the job. It is a tough job. I get it. I don't want anyone to be hurt or killed. But I just want to see the same energy for black lives. And I just want to see the same energy for poor people's lives, man. People are out here struggling and, and, and harming themselves and each other because of a system that has neglected and oppressed them. And I just want to see the same. In the, I want to see robots that bring people organic foods. I want to see a robot that, that helps someone to, to pay their bills and, and balance their budgets and, you know, gives them the education they need. Like, we don't need to be investing in robot police dogs, man. And, and again, what if you live you live in Edenwall? You know, again, you, 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 you struggling, a lot going on. You feel like you don't got supports. You don't have anything happening for you. And you got too many police. And now you got a, a robot walking through your block like monitoring what's going on that's it's crazy to me and that's why like i'm well that, really but that's because they want to continue to um 
occupied. This is occu- well, this occupied, is, but also occupied. demoralize, yes. but demoralize, yeah. Yeah. yes, yeah. demoralize and make poor people feel like shit. Completely helpless and completely hopeless. And you know, I was talking on another uh, platform the other day about Dante Wright's uh, murder, and people don't understand like. Every time, a, every time a black person, particularly a black man, is killed by the police, I feel like a part of my soul is ripped out of me. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like part of me dies with that person. Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Dante Wright, Ahmed Aubrey, so many others, man. And, and it's like they continue, they, they continue to con- con- attack our soul and our spirit, and, and they, they're doing everything in their power to leave us feeling helpless and hopeless. But it ain't gonna work. It's not. It's not gonna work. You know, we we won Georgia. We got Biden in there. We gonna push him to, to do the right thing, and we're doing it on the state, city, and local level. And the streets are are, are, are rising up. So it's not gonna work. Jamal Bowman, before we uh, part today, um, DMX. He's from the area that you represent. Um, he put YO on the map in many ways. Um, I would love to hear. You know, what's going on in the local community? Have you had any conversations with how we are going to memorialize and immortalize uh, DMX for not Mm. only who he is um, as an artist, but, you know, even like we were just talking about the demoralization of poor people, you know, the lack of funding, you know, DMX comes from that, the story and the pain and and all of that DMX put into his music. So to really honor his life would be to address those issues and also immortalize him in some way. Absolutely. So first of all, when he was in the hospital, I couldn't even get to the hot, like I, I, I was trying to get to White Plains Hospital for the vigil. I couldn't even turn down the block. It was crazy. So the outpouring of support and love was ridiculous. And the only way I got to turn down the block, I had to tell a dude, my name's Jamal Bowman. I'm a member of Congress. Can I turn down this block? And the cop was like, cool. So that was cool. Um, But in Yonkers, in Mount Vernon, I I believe there's a vigil. There have been multiple vigils. Um, There's another big one, I believe, tomorrow in Mount Vernon uh, to honor and uplift him. But, you know, I tweeted about him, man. and, And he captures so much of you know, like like a lot of the artists do, he captures a lot of what uh, of what's happening in our community. So, you know, father who abandoned him, uh, struggles with him. He and his mom discarded to to a to a to a boys um, to boys children's village, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken. But but found his voice and and his and his art and his creativity through music and through writing. So that's powerful in and of itself. And then the grind, cause he, you know, and the Rough Riders documentary uh, gave me a lot of education on his background, 13 years before actually getting a deal. So grinding in the streets uh, with his art, struggling, homeless, not having any money, uh, his 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 girlfriend, who's soon soon to be his wife, held him down. Like his whole narrative just captures everything that happens in our community. But then, ultimately, to have his breakthrough, and then to be the only uh, solo artist to have five number one release albums in a row, is 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 mind blowing. While struggling with addiction that entire time, right? So it it, it captures our trauma. It captures how our communities have been neglected. It captures the power of music and the arts to to rescue uh, children and people and give them a second opportunity. He is one of the most prolific MCs and poets in American history, and we need to name it as such. Um, and, and then another one we lost too early, you know, Prince Michael Jackson, Luther Vandross, DMX and and, and and so many others. Big and Pac. Um, and big and Pac and right. So he he cap, he encapsulates all that and captures all that. So we need to figure out how to it, memorialize and immortalize his, him in Yonkers and in the district. And one thing about the district, I mean, he's born in Mount Vernon, raised in Yonkers, both parts of my district. 
Man, the district also has Denzel Washington and Mary J. Blige and Heavy D and the boys and so many other slick Ray Rock, CL Small. Right, right. I wanna I wanna figure out as a member of Congress who was raised by hip hop culture, figure out how to uplift the culture and, and use the, the 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 unlimited potential of the culture to unlock the unlimited potential in the district. Because there's so many young kids in the district who come from similar backgrounds to DMX who just need opportunity. And I hope as a member of Congress, we don't just immortalize DMX and those who are lost. We use his example to nurture and plant seeds for the upcoming generation to transform the district and the world in the same way DMX did. Yo, uh, thank you for the words. Thank you for your time today, Jamal Bowman. Pick a DMX record on the way out. What you wanna hear right now? <laughs> Stop being greedy, man. Republican Party need to stop being greedy. Y'all trying to hoard all the money for Wall Street and the wealthy elite. It's time to share it with the with the people, man. Stop being greedy. It is. Jamal thank Bowman, you, Jamal. thank you for your time today. Hashtag listen to Jamal Bowman. I've been trying to get that. Yo, my hashtags never take off, Laura. What's the problem, man? My, <laughs> my hashtags don't get popping out here like that. Peace, Jamal. Love, thank you, man. Thank you, man. Have peace, a good Jamal. one. All right, peace.